made sense that I wanted to do some kind of intro. Okay, um, yeah. welcome yeah. everybody uh, to today's uh, Lunch and Learn, and we're thrilled to have an alum back with us. And I want to introduce um, Simon Weiss, who's going to do the introductions for us today, and who is one of the co-presidents of Allies. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for coming to our event this Monday uh, called Shaping International Law to Combat Climate Change, Island States' Efforts Before the International Court. And as someone who's traveled in the Pacific Islands, specifically through the IGL, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Duncan Pickard. He's, he is an associate attorney in the Public International Law Group at Deba Weiss and Pimpton LLP in New York, where he represents sovereign states, international organizations, uh, and uh, in the... Uh, individuals in a wide variety of disputes before international courts and tribunals. More recently, he has acted as counsel for the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law, otherwise known as COSIS, an international organization representing 10 small islands in the Pacific and Caribbean to bring a request for an advisory opinion on climate change before the International Tribunal for the uh, Law of the Sea. He also advises COSIS in the advisory proceedings on climate change pending before the International Court of Justice. Duncan is a graduate of the Stanford Law School, the Harvard Kennedy School, and Tufts University. While at Tufts, uh, Duncan was an IGL synaptic scholar, a Tisch scholar, and president of the TCU Senate, among other activities. So please uh, join me in welcoming Duncan, who is going to talk about. Great. Thank you very much. Um, just as a quick show of hands, I curious, we're covering a lot of issues on this talk, and I was just kind of curious about what in, interested people in the talk. Um, and just by a show of hands, I'm going to ask three questions, and you can raise your hand as many times as you want. How many of you are, would you say, are like very interested in international law? And international law is what brought you here. A little, little higher. Okay, great. And how many people are really interested in climate change? That's what brought you here. Okay, and how many people are interested in small islands? And that, that's what brought you here. Okay, <laughs> interesting, great, yeah. <laughs> some, some, I saw some people raised three hands, but that's great, just to get a, a little bit of a sense. We're gonna be covering um, all three of those topics. Um, and I, I thought, um, so given kind of the interest in, in climate change, um, I thought what I would do is um, first just talk a bit about kind of where we are with climate change, where we are with climate science, um, the, the urgency of the crisis, um, because that's that factual reality of small island states is really what motivated these islands to get together and um, try to shape international law in a way that can that can help their uh, help them in this really existential crisis. Um, then I'll talk a bit about the sources of international law that could bear on that issue. Um, and then I'll talk about the role that this group of small island states that, that I and my colleagues have been working with, what they've been doing to uh, invoke those sources of law um, for themselves, uh, for their own benefit, and for the benefit of all of humanity, frankly. Um, and then uh, hopefully we'll have some, have some time for, for questions after. But if, if everyone's on board with that kind of uh, agenda, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just get started. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's no surprise that uh, climate change, of course, is, is, uh, is an urgent problem um, for all of humanity, for the natural environment, for humans all over the world. But there's really no group of um, people that's more vulnerable to climate change than people who live on small islands. And that's for several reasons. They um, are, by definition, uh, physically isolated from continents uh, in, in many cases. So they don't have the same kinds of access to resources to help them adapt to, um, to climate change, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in the way that, that other communities might have. Um, islands are uniquely surrounded on all sides by water, of course. So they're uniquely affected by sea level rise, uh, which actually presents a, an existential threat to some islands uh, given the reality that under current projections, without adaptation, some sm small islands will be completely submerged by 2050 at the at the earliest, um, and they have uh, also just this in intensely intimate relationship with the sea, um, and the sea is a is a, a principal um, 
uh, climate change is actually a princ principally a marine phenomenon. We think about uh, climate change affecting, you know, um, you know, causing wildfires, causing extreme heat waves, things that affect those of us who live in kind of terrestrial uh, environments. But actually, climate change is primarily a marine phenomenon. And wh what do I mean by that? Well, 90% uh, of the heat energy that Earth's atmosphere has trapped, uh, the, sorry, excuse me, 90% uh, of the heat energy that greenhouse gases have trapped in the atmosphere since the industrial er era has ended up in the ocean. Um, and just to give one statistic on that, um, the amount of heat energy that the ocean absorbs is equal to seven times the energy uh, of one Hiroshima bomb every second. So every second of the day, the ocean is absorbing seven times the energy of one Hiroshima bomb. Um, and that is, uh, and then uh, in addition to that, the ocean is also absorbing 25% of the carbon that greenhouse gas emissions have, uh, have emitted into the atmosphere. Um, and that causes a, a range of devastating effects, including ocean acidification, uh, which is one of the, the really significant uh, problems of, of climate change. And so um, the, both of these uh, issues, the extreme increase in heat energy, heat content that's, that's in the ocean, plus ocean acidification are, are driving a crisis in, in, the, in, the, in the marine environment. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and this is, um, you know, ocean, ocean warming and ocean acidification um, uh, have various effects that we can get into if, if you're interested um, on um, changing the physics and chemistry of the ocean that make it uh, difficult for marine life to live there. And, uh, and also, um, uh, ocean warming is what causes sea level rise. And that's because everyone thinks about uh, glaciers melting um, as, as contributing to sea level rise. That actually contributes only about 25 to 35% of sea level rise. Most of sea level rise uh, comes from, from actual warming of the ocean because as things warm, they expand. And so half of, half of sea level rise is attributable to um, to that. Um, and so, um, all, you know, th this is, you know, th this is th these problems of, of climate change on the ocean and more generally have been known for a very long time. There have been uh, huge uh, diplomatic efforts, we all know, of the UNFCCC, the Paris Agreement, um, these climate commitments that, have, that, have, uh, that states have made um, together over the years. But we also know that none of this is enough. Uh, and, and this frustration with um, diplomatic negotiations around climate change while um, small island states are, are feeling the, the worst effects of them is exactly what motivated states to get together um, and, and try to, try to uh, leverage international law um, to, um, uh, to help their cause. And so actually just before transitioning to international law, I wanted to also just talk briefly about um, where we are. Um, so this, th these, uh, these next three slides that I'm going to show come from the uh, IPCC, the Intergov Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the UN body dedicated to talking about climate science. Um, and the IPCC has come with this framework of a carbon budget. And essentially what that means is how much carbon can humans continue to emit into the atmosphere uh, and still reach the target of keeping average uh, global temperatures to within 1.5 degrees Celsius from pre-industrial levels. Um, and actually, I should just first say why 1.5 degrees is, is significant. There's, a, there's strong evidence from the IPCC's reporting that average global warming of what, above 1.5 degrees Celsius will uh, dramatically increase the likelihood of catastrophic consequences of climate change. Any degree, any increment of, of climate change is harmful, even at 1.5 degrees. And there's actually strong evidence that even at 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, fragile ecosystems like coral reefs uh, will not be able to survive uh, at that, at, that uh, at those sustained temperatures. So I don't mean to, no one's saying that 1.5 is okay, but the risks of um, 
uh, climate change increased dramatically above 1.5, even at two degrees, and especially at three degrees and as we get warmer. So um, the, uh, the, the carbon budget that the IPCC has calculated here um, uh, looks at how much carbon humans can emit to keep at 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the, the stark uh, reality of that is that we need to limit um, car uh, carbon emissions to 400 to 500 billion tons of, of CO2 or CO2 equivalents, because CO2 isn't the only um, greenhouse gas. And we are currently emitting around uh, 40 billion tons annually. So, um, and, and this is this is what's what's shown um, by by this graphic of, of, of exactly of exactly where we're at. Um, and so, uh, just to put this in, in other terms, this is what the um, IPCC has calculated for how much carbon we need to reduce from 2020, 2019 emissions levels um, to have some probability of keeping emissions within, uh, of keeping global warming within 1.5 degrees Celsius. And what they say here is um, by 2030, we need to have reduced uh, emissions by 48%, by 2035, 65%, uh, and then by 2050, 99%. So we need to get to globally net zero uh, by, by 2050. Um, and uh, again, I'm sorry to be the further bearer of bad news, but we're just nowhere near uh, this. So this uh, graph shows um, the IPC's estimates of where emissions levels are based on uh, states' commitments, nationally determined uh, contribution commitments under the Paris Agreement frameworks. Um, this, uh, these probabilities are showing where um, the uh, trend, trend lines are going for declared commitments. Um, uh, actually, sorry, this, this, is actually, this is actually a better one. Um, so this is showing where we are for, for declared commitments. This is the, the purple line. Um, uh, uh, so we are uh, at just declared commitments. We're not uh, nearly where we need to be. We need to be down here to get to 1.5. This is where the current commitments actually are, and this is where implemented commitments are. So implemented mm -hmm. commitments under the Paris Agreement framework actually have us going up by 5% of, of, uh, of CO2 emissions, uh, down from the 43% that we need to be at. Um, so anyway, this is all to say, it's a very stark picture of, of, of the progress that we're making toward, uh, toward greenhouse <laughs> gas emission uh, uh, reductions to make, to make 1.5 um, degrees Celsius. Um, a reality. So it's in this it's in this framework um, that um, states that small island um, that small island states started thinking about what is the you know how what, what what tools do they have available to them to try to emphasize the need of getting to 1.5 degrees Celsius because the diplomatic negotiations clearly aren't working or they're not enough um, and. So there's been a, an effort over the past um, several years um, to try to use international law to um, bolster the, the effort toward, toward 1.5 degrees Celsius. And you know, the Paris Agreement is a form of international law and there are binding commitments under the Paris Agreement, but the actual temperature target uh, of 1.5 degrees Celsius in the Paris Agreement isn't formally binding on, on states. Um, at least that's kind of the generally accepted view. Um, and so the idea was, you know, how can we actually find a binding source of international law or sources of international law to underscore that states are not only under a kind of moral commitment to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, but how can we underscore that that is a binding legal commitment as a matter of international law? Um, and so um, there was a, a process of, of kind of surveying what the potentially relevant sources of law are. Um, but the first one um, that, that states agreed to kind of come up with is um, a treaty called the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS. So uh, raise your hand if, you, if you've heard of, of UNCLOS before, if you know something about UNCLOS. A little higher. OK, um, so um, UNCLOS is a a widely accepted treaty. It has um, over 190 member states 
unfortunately, the United States is not a member state. Maybe that's why it's not uh, very well recognized in the, in the U.S. Um, but uh, UNCLOS um, was create was uh, signed first and negotiated in the 1980s. And the idea of UNCLOS was to come up with a constitution for the ocean. So UNCLOS has over 200 articles. In it, it regulates all aspects of the law of the sea of kind of maritime affairs. That includes um, <clears throat> maritime boundary delimitation, rights of um, ships on the high seas. Uh, it's a comprehensive framework for dealing with the ocean. But one of its most significant um, chapters uh, is re relates to the marine environment and particularly um, the protection and preservation of the marine environment. That's one of the bedrock um, goals of UNCLOS uh, uh, that that states uh, that states signed up to, um, and one of the most firm commitments that states have under this general framework of protection and preservation of the marine environment is to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment. Um, and this is very important because pollution of the marine environment has a very precise term under uh, UNCLOS. And it, the, the, the definition of pollution of the marine environment is the introduction by man, it should be uh, by people, um, of substances or energy likely to result in or are likely to result in deleterious effects. So just take that a little bit more slowly. Uh, introduction by people of substances or energy that result in or are likely to result in deleterious effects. So you can see where we're, where we're going with this. The, the, the definition of pollution isn't limited to you know, particular pollutants that you might think of like bleach or oil or something like that. It, it's, it's actually a, a kind of physical action of people doing something that introduces um, substances or energy into the marine environment. And so um, the, the argument in, in this context is that greenhouse gas emissions constitute pollution of the marine environment because they introduce um, substances in the form of carbon. I, I mentioned that 25% of carbon dioxide ends up in the ocean, so that's a substance. And it introduces energy in the form of heat because of that, the, those seven, um, you know, seven Hiroshima bomb equivalents that end up every second. That's a form of heat. And uh, we don't need to spend too much time talking about the deleterious effects because there, we, we know that there are many of them. Um, so the, 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 the idea was, you know, how can we, and then, and then if, you, if you meet that definition, it automatically uh, creates a whole host of obligations on states to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment, to coordinate with other states to achieve that goal, to um, protect rare and fragile ecosystems from pollution of the marine environment, and also to provide technical assistance to developing states in, uh, in, in preventing, reducing, and control, uh, controlling pollution of the marine environment. So there's a, there are over 20 articles related just to pollution of the marine environment, if you can meet that definition. So that would unlock, and all of those are binding, so that would unlock a huge uh, body of law that states can use um, to, try to, uh, to try to address greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so, so how, you know, then, then the next question is how do you, you know, get a finding of, of, of that, you know, you can argue it and it has been argued in academic papers, but how do you actually, you know, get a finding on this? So, um, what a group of states did is, um, they created an international organization, uh, that Simon mentioned called the, the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change or International Law, COSIS. Um, today, COSIS has um, uh, 10 member states, five from the Caribbean and five from the Pacific. And the reason that they created an international organization is because that allows that organization to then make a request for an advisory opinion from a court, an international court called the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, or ITLOS. And the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea is, a, is an international court, it's based in Hamburg, Germany, and it was created by UNCLOS, uh, by that treaty. And it has this um, jurisdiction over 
over to, to hear requests for advisory opinions from international organizations. Um, so COSIS, COSIS got together um, and made uh, uh, made this request. Um, Uh, that's that's COSIS's logo. Um, COSIS got together and made a request for an advisory opinion asking what are states' obligations to um, prevent, reduce, and control greenhouse gas emissions under UNCLOS. Um, and that, um, so that request went to IDLOS. Uh, that was filed in December of 2022. Um, and then uh, in June of 2023, there was a round of written statements where COSIS and any other uh, member state, uh, any other party to UNCLOS could kind of make submissions on this question. And then um, in September of last year, there was a hearing at IDLOS over two weeks where uh, COSIS um, made presentations over two days before the tribunal. And um, then any other uh, state or international organization could also <coughs> make, make statements. So that, that lasted uh, two weeks. Um, and that's just one, one photo from the hearing. This is the COSIS uh, legal team. And I'm, I'm, uh, I got involved with this, uh, I'm privileged to say, because I, my firm acts as counsel to COSIS, uh, and I was uh, among the legal team um, representing, representing the commission uh, in, in Hamburg. Uh, so we had, um, a, as you can see, a huge team of really renowned legal experts who did the oral submissions and the, the uh, prime ministers of uh, Antigua and Barbuda and Tuvalu, who are the co-chairs of COSIS, uh, were there during the submissions as well. Um, uh, and then, uh, and so that, that, that request is currently pending. Uh, we're hoping that ITLOS will make, a, make an advisory, render its advisory opinion in May. At the same time, um, uh, the General Assembly of the United Nations has made a request for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice in The Hague. And how, how many people have, uh, I guess, first heard of the ICJ in, in The Hague? Uh, well, almost everyone. And how many people heard about the request that the General Assembly made to the ICJ um, about, about climate change? So okay, so that, that's great. So the um, so this is a, a very very significant advisory uh, advisory uh, opinion uh, advisory proceedings that are that are coming out. So in um, in uh, uh, December again, or uh, actually maybe it was in the it was in the winter of, of last year, the General Assembly um, by record numbers made a request for an advisory opinion also on climate change to the ICJ. Um, and that request is much broader than UNCLOS. Uh, it actually invokes basically any source of international law, um, including various sources under international environmental law, international human rights law, um, the Paris Agreement itself, um, a, a, wide, a wide range of sources. And so that is a request um, for, uh, again, an advisory opinion, um, but it, that'll, that will be significant in a different way than, than the one at ITLOS because they'll be opining on kind of general sources of law um, that will bind all states, whatever they say will, will kind of explain obligations that bind all states, uh, not just uh, those that are party to UNCLOS. Um, and so those <clears throat> proceedings are currently underway. We're, we're, we're not the requesting organization, COSIS, but we're preparing uh, COSIS's legal submissions and we're also preparing um, submissions for uh, Tuvalu, um, uh, uh, which is participating in its own right. Um, and just to say, um, and so we'll, we're kind of in the written phase, and then there'll be a hearing probably next year. Um, but uh, just to say, I want to focus on one thing regarding Tuvalu, because um, uh, Tuvalu is one of these states that is most, that is under threat of being completely submerged by the sea level rise. Um, and so there's, they obviously have a huge stake in the international environmental law obligations related to the destruction of their uh, kind of uh, marine environment and their land, their land territory. But there's also a, a hugely difficult and significant question of international law um, regarding the actual disappearance of the entire land territory of a state, which 
is actually something that has never occurred in international law in the absence of um, an armed conflict or a state's own consent to be merged with another state. Um, so, you know, how does international law deal with a situation where a state completely disappears from the face of the earth from the, as a result of the, uh, you know, illegal conduct of other polluting states? Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and especially when a bedrock principle of international law is sovereign equality among states. I mean, how can you kind of emit something from the U.S. and it has an impact in Tuvalu and, you know, what, what, what's the international law situation there? So that's something that we've been thinking a lot about is, is you know, what, what are what obligations do other states owe Tuvalu and what, what are Tuvalu's continuing uh, rights and obligations uh, in the event, in the tragic event that it's that its land, ter land territory becomes totally submerged. Um, and one um, significant issue that has come up in that context for Tuvalu, but also other states, is um, what happens to the um, what happens to uh, the rights that states have that emanate from their coastline. Um, so one of the principles that comes out of UNCLOS um, is that states have a range of what are called maritime entitlements um, to you know, exploit natural resources in the area around their land territory, fishing, uh, you know, deep sea mining, uh, things like this. Um, but the, all of those kind of maritime entitlements are calculated from what's called the baseline, which is the median um, high water mark from their coast. So in the event of sea level rise, as you know, as the, as the coast, as the baseline, or as the kind of median sea level rise increases, does that mean that your uh, maritime entitlements also shrink? Um, you know, no one thinks that that's very fair, um, but the principle of baseline, you know, calculating entitlements from baselines is also totally fundamental to the UNCLOS regime. Um, so there's also an, a movement to try to create a principle that you have to fix baselines um, as at a particular point in time uh, before the effects of sea level rise, notwithstanding the physical changes in the coastline. Um, but that, you know, that's also a very kind of difficult and interesting international law problem, how to, how to, go, about, um, how to go about that. So, um, um, that. so all of these are gonna be, you know, really significant issues in these, in these advisory proceedings. And, um, and we, you know, we hopefully will have ITLOSes in May and then probably the ICJ sometime next year. Um, I should also mention that there are, there's a third um, set of advisory proceedings that are pending before um, another court, uh, another international court called the um, Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which has jurisdiction over um, a human rights treaty that governs the Americas. So they'll be focusing um, specifically on kind of human rights impacts, which of course is another huge uh, area of law um, given, you know, effects to the right to life, um, right to right to family, right to um, home uh, home life, given kind of displacement concerns. Um, so there, there's a there's a huge uh, range of international law that's implicated by by all of these challenges. Um, so uh, just uh, spend a few minutes on kind of like where we go from here and what all of this means. But then I'd love to take uh, questions too. So once we have these advisory proceedings, none of the, none of the kind of, you know, a, a unique feature of, of advisory proceedings is that it's not like a, a typical court proceeding where it's like one party against another party and then the judgment is binding on the other party. It's the, the opinions themselves are not binding in that formal sense, but they will be clarifying um, obligations that themselves are binding on, on states. And so, um, so these will be, you know, hugely significant uh, opinions in, in, in figuring out what states' uh, obligations are under international law. Um, and then there'll be a significant process of kind of trying to figure out how to best make use of those opinions to advance the cause of, of climate mitigation and uh, adaptation to climate change. And so, you know, uh, one kind of um, ideal outcome from that would be that states 
reinterpret their positions in diplomatic negotiations in light of their binding obligations under international law to make even more ambitious commitments and then actually you know, implement and, and abide by, by the commitments that they've made. Um, another potential mechanism um, is that states uh, can actually bring contentious proceedings against other states. That's a feature of the UNCLOS system um, where one of the core parts of UNCLOS is that states can bring claims against other states um, for their breaches of UNCLOS, including for uh, their international environmental obligations. Um, and so there's been some kind of preliminary thinking about what a claim by a small island state against an emitting state would look like and you know what kind of relief they could ask for or how to you know how to implement that. Um, and then there's also the you know the opportunities to kind of implement um, international obligations into domestic law. Um, so you know a lot of countries, not the US, but a lot of countries um, you know uh, uh, directly implement their international law obligations into domestic law. Um, and we, I mean, one kind of U.S. example of that is um, you, you all might be familiar of the case that um, some young um, folks in Montana brought against the Montana state government <coughs> and got a, uh, a favorable uh, judgment from the Montana Supreme Court around the government's um, obligations under Montana law to think about the impacts of climate change when regulating um, oil and gas fields. And so something like that is totally conceivable as well in other countries where, you know, if the international courts kind of clarify international law obligations, then there would be an opportunity to implement those directly into, into domestic law in the courts or, or through some other means. So, um, um, so I mean, you know, uh, the, you know we, 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 we know, we know how, how urgent this problem is, and I, I don't think you know, even the people who are most passionate about international law don't think that international law will be the only, you know, solution to, to this problem. Um, but climate change is a quintessentially global problem. And we know that, uh, that the highest uh, international courts in the world have to be able to say something about kind of um, international cooperation obligations in, in, these, in these circumstances. So, um, this is a, it's a very, you know, a sobering time to think about where we are with climate science and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but it's also a very exciting time in terms of international law. And, and I'm, I'm hopeful that these um, favorable, hopefully favorable decisions from international courts will be able to spur more climate action and come up with a kind of a legal framework for thinking about um, obligations of mitigation and adaptation. So um, that was uh, that was what all I wanted to say about that. Uh, but happy to happy to answer any questions uh, that, that you might have. Yeah, please. Um, from where do these um, legal institutions derive their authority, their legitimacy? Um, what uh, power do they have to uh, enforce their decisions? What power do they have to uh, apply consequences to failure to uh, part states to abide by the rulings? Um, yes. Well, you know, famously, uh, international courts have no uh, have no enforcement um, mechanism uh, in the same way that no no court has any really formal enforcement mechanism in the sense of a police force or something like that. Um, but um, you know these courts. I, I'll, I'll say especially ITLOS and the ICJ are um, extremely authoritative in in their domains. Um, so you know it, ITLOS is the or is the that is the dedicated international court for the law of the sea for a region of the or you know, part of the globe that occupies 70% of the Earth's surface. Um, and their judgments, uh, actually all of their judgments um, in contentious cases have been, and in advisor opinion, uh, opinions, have been um, complied with uh, by states. Of course, um, you know, they, they haven't 
heard a case nearly as consequential as this one in their history. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that it was a very positive sign that um, uh, there was a very high state participation at the hearing in Hamburg. Um, over 50 states and international organizations participated in either the written or the oral phase, including some large emitter states, including China, uh, India, um, the UK, the EU, Australia, um, uh, some, some others. Um, and so those, so I, I think it's a very good sign that, that states are taking this, you know, are taking this seriously. The ICJ um, as well, um, you know, the ICJ is the, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. They haven't, um, the, we, we haven't yet had the first round of written statements, so we don't know how many states will participate in those proceedings, but by all accounts, it'll be even more than at ITLOS. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think that, um, as I said, even though the courts, these advisory proceedings are non-binding and the courts themselves don't have any enforcement power, um, they will be, you know, the, the opinions that they render will be clarifying binding legal obligations. And there are a number of other mechanisms that can, that are available to implement international obligations in general, including through diplomatic conferences, through national courts, like I mentioned. Um, and I think also just through kind of public pressure. I mean, it's going to make a big difference for um, climate activists, for even, you know, legislators maybe in, 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 in national legislatures to be able to say, this isn't only a moral obligation you have, but it's a binding legal obligation, you know, uh, as clarified by the highest court in this in this field, um, and so you know I'm, you know I, I, but you know but at the same time I mean it's uh, like as we know from climate change solving the problem is going to require a huge transformation of the entire global economy and no one thinks that just you know because the ICJ wrote down on a piece of paper that you have to do that that you know that so it's you know it's it's it, it hopefully is something that is going to be part of incremental change that 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 uh, that, that that's the only way to solve the solve the crisis. Yeah, uh, I'm curious if there's been any push for the United States to sign on to or even ratify UNCLOS at all. Yes, there there definitely has been. Um, the U.S. Um, actually participated in in drafting UNCLOS, um, which is kind of an mo for the U.S. to participate in <clears throat> drafting big international treaties and then they extract concessions in that process and then they don't actually even sign <laughs> the final document. Um, so um, there, there, was, there was an effort um, when it was first signed in the 80s for the US to sign on. There was another big push in the 90s under the Clinton administration uh, for the US to sign on, um, but it, it didn't. Um, and the, the, it's interesting, though, because the, the position that the U.S. takes is, and it's a, it's a little bit vague, but the, the, the argument that has been made uh, for, well, one argument that's been made for not signing up to UNCLOS is that UNCLOS already reflects what's called customary international law, which is automatically binding on all states without signing up to a treaty. Um, so they say, you know, we don't need to sign up to UNCLOS because we accept that these principles reflect customary international law. I think another element of that is, as I mentioned before, when you sign up to UNCLOS, you sign up to its binding dispute resolution mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. is really wary of signing up to any kind of binding dispute resolution mechanism. So under international law. So I think that's, you know, that's a big thing that's that's motivating it. it it's it, it'll. You know, I, I, I don't know for sure whether that the U.S.'s statement on UNCLOS reflecting customer international law, whether that also applies to the obligations on um, the marine environment. Um, and so, you know, we'll obviously be reading the U.S.'s submissions very closely in the ICJ to see what they, what if anything they say about that. Um, but, uh, you know, the U.S., the, 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 the sources of law that the, that are the subject of the ICJ's um, 
that will be the subject of the ICJ's advisory opinion will be binding on the U.S. because they'll largely be interpreting customary international law. Um, so, you know, that, um, you know, uh, that, that that's also going to be very interesting to watch, but good question about the plus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do other treaties have similar kind of legal power as UNCLOS, like say the Kyoto Protocol? Yes, uh, no. Um, <laughs> uh, um, the, the binding dispute resolution mechanisms under UNCLOS are pretty unique to UNCLOS. Um, the, there, are, there are a number of treaties that have, um, that contain consent where states consent to binding dispute resolution, um, but they're pretty, especially in international environmental law, those are pretty rare. Um, and none of the climate change treaties um, have binding dispute resolution mechanisms. And many of them don't even create binding um, legal obligations, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Um, one kind of exception to that is there is um, a, an annex to the Paris Agreement that talks about um, conciliation, which is a different form of um, dispute resolution. It's non-binding, it's often not public, um, but the where conciliation has been successful in the past, it's an opportunity for two states who have a dispute to get together with a neutral conciliator to try to sort out their differences and come up with a fix. Um, and the, um, uh, but so the Paris Agreement contemplates conciliation, um, but it needs to be implemented by a subsequent agreement um, among state uh, parties to the Paris Agreement, and that hasn't been um, done. Uh, but there's a, an effort to try to, um, to try to come up with rules for Paris Agreement conciliation. Um, uh, um, but other, other than that, Kiro, no, you don't have to see no. Um, so we've, we've been talking about like obligations of states under international law, mm -hmm. and there's no like denying the pressing nature of climate change. Like I feel like it's pretty generally understood, but also I feel like there's a pushback of some states about the right to develop or the right to self determination. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk about that, like how you would maybe push back against that if you would, um, and then like um, if you think it's possible to develop a scheme where like maybe states that haven't developed yet have that right to do that, yes. but then maybe states like the U.S. or like Western countries that have already developed, maybe they should bear the like biggest responsibility to address climate change. Absolutely. Now, this is a really great, really, really great question. Um, and a really the, the most difficult issue, I think, um, in, in terms of figuring out what these obligations are. So um, I just want to first just separate two things. You mentioned the right to self-determination and the right to development. Um, and and um, I'm going to just separate those and talk about self-determination first, because I think it's a little bit easier to come up with counter arguments in that context. Actually, one of the main arguments that we're making on behalf of the small island states is that um, the right to that the disappearance of land territory um, implicates the right to self-determination uh, because it, this, you know, you need to be able to have a land to kind of organize your political um, systems. Um, but this is a, a really, that's kind of a novel situation because cl classically the right to self-determination, um, this is a really a post-war legal concept um, and, and it entails um, kind of two, traditionally two aspects external uh, self-determination, which is mainly in the decolonization process, and then internal self-determination, which is like, um, you know, separate to, you know, or not separatist, but like, you know, subnational um, entities that want to be independent and in what situations can you, is, is that appropriate? So that's kind of how that area of law developed. And it hasn't been applied in this, in this particular context, but um, that's kind of one issue. I think the right to development is, is, and even if you don't call because it's a little bit controversial about whether there's a right to development or not, but even if you just say, you know, even take it out of the context of rights, like states have, a, you know, the power to, uh, you know, provide for their own populations. It's kind of like their whole job. Um, so, you know, why 
I mean, no one would ever frame it like this, but just like to put it in kind of stark terms, you know, why does the, you know, why do the rights of, of 10,000 Tuvaluans, you know, to have their own territory, how, should we be counterbalancing that against the right of, you know, a billion Indians to, you know, develop their electrical grid in a way that the United States was able to do so before the, all the facts about climate change were uh, known. Uh, so, you know, uh, how, how do you kind of sort all, through all this? And, and it's really, really difficult. And I think, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think one, and one, one way that this, that this comes up is um, in this concept of common but differentiated responsibilities or CBDR, um, which is, um, how, how many, raise your hand if you've heard of that? Phrase before, so that what it what it what it relates to is is the idea that you know states bear states should bear responsibility for their impacts on the environment relative to their contributions to that problem. Um, so you know the the U.S. you know and China bear you know well let's just start by saying the U.S. and Europe uh, bear way more responsibility you know historically for greenhouse gas emissions than anyone else. But should we be you know thinking about CBDR in that like historical context, all the way back to the Industrial Revolution, or should we be thinking about it in today? Because today, India is, if it's not the biggest emitter, it's one of them. Um, and but historically, it's like not significant because it only started major emissions in the past decade. Um, so you know where do you know where where do, where do we come come down with that? I mean, I think. I think the answer has to be, well, I mean, you know, we have to find other ways of, of kind of advancing development priorities um, while acknowledging the reality that, like, it's deeply unfair that, 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 you know, developing countries that just started emitting don't get the benefit of kind of cheap fuel in the way that developed countries have. But there's not really another solution. I mean, we have to, we have to stop emitting. And, and, there, and there should be other ways of rebalancing those um, economic benefits, um, uh, which itself is a huge issue, um, but it's a, it, it's the you know it's the biggest it's the biggest problem uh, in the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, just so this will be the last question. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> what are you and your colleagues, maybe your law firm, maybe some of these commissions that you're on, doing to prepare for the possibility of another four years of Trump? Another four years of Trump. Um, um, great question. Um, I mean, I know it's a huge question, but I imagine yeah. that things could shift quite rapidly. Yes. Well, I mean, well, so I, I don't, I don't know. You know, um, uh, I, I, you know, I'm sure that our clients have a very developed kind of policy response to your question. From a legal perspective, um, um, you know, I mean, the U.S. didn't participate in in, in the Idlis proceedings. I think um, they're not going to be bound by by that judgment in itself. the The ICJ um, will bind on will bind the U.S. and and um, and the and in the you know the U.S. obviously is a huge is a huge emitter. Not the biggest, but a but a very significant one, um, and so I think um, I mean I think of another four years of Trump person would be catastrophic. I don't mean to be <laughs> downplaying it, but I, I think from a kind of legal strategy, um, I don't think it really has much of an impact. To be honest, I mean it, it'll you know it'll have an impact in you know the way that the U.S. Um, responds to climate change from a policy perspective, but like. From a legal matter, I think you know the obligations are what they are, um, and we need to stand firm on that. So, yeah, great. Yeah. Well, thank everyone for coming. That's the end of our talk for today. There will be future ones in the next coming weeks as well. So stay tuned for for all of that from the IGL. But thanks again. Um, can we get one more round of applause for for our speaker? <laughs> Thanks. More food if you want to take it, and thank you. Perfect. So yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>